All right, class, welcome back. As you may remember, last week we went over how Europe came to go from this to this after the devastation of the Great War. Today, we will dive further into the consequences of this, as few were content with the new status quo. Let's start with the British. Immediately after the war, the British began to pull back from global politics. The war had exhausted them, as they provided the funding for most of the Entente members. And to make matters worse, it was Britain that committed the most to allowing the white armies to achieve victory and reinstall Nicholas II on the Russian throne. So, with all of this effort, what did Britain have to show for it? They got some minor colonial possessions in Africa, but they had to give up all of Ireland due to steep American pressure. Quite frankly, the Brits were sick of it all. The new focus for London was simple. Repay the American debt, restore and improve the British economy, and attempt to restore ties to the empire, focusing inwards. The British message to the world was simple. The future of Europe is theirs to decide, with the French basically having to assume the full weight of peacekeeping. But France wasn't doing too well either. Yes, they had regained the Alsace and gotten some German war operations, but they soon realized they had no way, except for a full invasion of Germany, which nobody was enthusiastic about, to actually enforce these payments. With the German economy in shambles, within two years they already struggled with repaying the French. The French needed a new plan and appealed to the Americans for aid. With American arbitration, a new plan was set up. America gave cheap loans to the Germans, the French were repaid by the Germans, and the French would then repay their debts to the Americans. A perfect agreement I see nothing wrong with. But this cooperation would go even further. France was hungry for coal, something they had lacked in their own empire. Failing to secure any new coal supply from Germany, France would pressure Germany to open up their economy allowing the two European giants to work ever closer together. This tacit approval by America and especially France would slowly legitimize the Weimar democracy. Even better, these economic cooperations made the way for the Weimar miracle, where German industry began to boom and the German economy recovered insanely well. By the end of the decade, Germany had returned as a respected, democratic, European great power. And this German return to relevance was mostly fueled by developments elsewhere. Italy, despite gaining far more territory than they bargained for, still fell into a deep, deep recession. This would radicalize the Italian people, and by 1920 it seemed like Italy was ripe for a civil war between the socialists, the nationalists and the government. Victor Emmanuel, seeking to save his nation from such destruction, allowed the radical nationalists into government soon leading to the complete fall of Italy into a dictatorship. With Britain remaining silent on the matter, Italy began broadly proclaiming their natural hegemony over the Balkan. With these new threats, France and Germany came to align ever closer together to preserve European stability. But an even bigger threat was forming in the East. With Tsar Nicholas restored to power in Russia, he began to strengthen his grip on power. His experiences in captivity by the socialists only further deepened his belief. He mustn't trust the people. He cannot give in to popular demands. His task was made easier by the culling of the nobles by the revolution. Almost never before had a Russian Tsar been so absolutely in control of his nation. And Nicholas set out on the singular goal, restoring his empire fully. Soon though, he would realize that he couldn't simply seek massive reconquests in Europe. Or he would face a massive coalition he couldn't hope to beat. Especially considering the risk of a Japanese intervention from the East. So Russia would adopt a policy of détente towards Europe. Trying to get British, French and German assistance in industrial and military developments. Positioning Russia as the bulwark of Europe the first line of defense against the rise of China and Japan. This Russia-Japan rivalry would be the center point of the largest conflict of the time. Yet despite all of these tensions, and more, the world remained peaceful. That is, until a major recession hit the United States, the largest economy on the planet. As the fallout of the American economy collapsing cascaded throughout the world, everything would be forever changed. 
Britain was hit less heavily than expected, as their empire-focused economics had somewhat shielded them. Yet, for them, the crisis only reaffirmed Britain has to stand alone and cannot rely on the United States. In Russia, Nicholas II could only further consolidate control as a result of the crisis, while in Japan, the military began taking over more and more from the civilian government, undermining the vibrant democracy that Japan had before this. In Germany then, their economic miracle would finally slow down, and it was time to truly test the strength of the Weimar democracy. But luckily for all of us today, the German institutions held true. Yes, radicalism began to rise, and fast, but the government managed to remain in power, successfully convincing the people that the economic crash would be temporary. The other German states, though, weren't so lucky. The small Prussian state was the first to collapse into complete anarchy, voting itself to be annexed into Germany. Yet, before the German government could even consider accepting, the Polish minority would launch their own protests, demanding unification with Poland instead. It became a true European crisis. Luckily, German, French and Polish diplomats would meet in Krakow to discuss a resolution. This Krakow conference is seen as the foundation of modern Europe. The moods were positive and a comprehensive deal was struck. A new border was decided upon while opening up trade and migration between the two nations. The German-Polish alliance would be the basis for Eastern European stability into the future. And this positive attitude between France, Poland and Germany came in very useful, as a new party was about to take over in Bavaria. It was an alter-nationalist movement running on a platform of reunifying with Germany and then continuing to avenge all the lost territory after the war. In pursuit of these goals, the Bavarians requested integration into the German state, with a demand that their leader become Chancellor of Germany. Obviously, this was an unacceptable demand. Instead, the Weimar government publicly denounced the movement, launching an embargo of Bavaria. This would lead to Bavaria changing to a more bold tactic. They turned to Austria and started to support the growing pro-German movements there. Soon, most of southern Germany was in complete disarray as the revolts even began to spread into Germany itself. Something had to be done. So, with reluctant approval from France and Poland, German forces would enter Austria and Bavaria, with Germany forcing a return to democratic regimes there. While yes, this had ended the crisis, it immediately started a new one. This new situation raised serious questions as to what the point even was to have Austria and Bavaria be independent now. This led to a final reality check for France. This was their last chance to intervene. If Germany is allowed to achieve their full reunification, France would have no hope of standing up to Germany by themselves. After several high-level meetings, the French realized the only way to stop unification now was war, which was far from guaranteed to work. So instead, they doubled down on the Franco-German partnership. The German unification was allowed to go through and the Franco-German-Polish alliance was born. I'm sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you aren't subscribed. To keep up to date with the two videos I release every single week, consider doing so. Thank you. But that was Germany, an unlikely success story of the Versailles peace deal. Many other regions were far less lucky. One of the first issues came from the Caucasus. The union there was troubled from the start. So many dividing lines ran through the nation, their only unity came from fear of outside invasion. The union was very weak. Azerbaijan would be the center of the crisis that destroyed the union. They would successfully work with European companies to extract their major oil reserves. Yet, the Azeris refused to share this wealth with the rest of the union. This economic inequality would be the final straw. Georgia and Armenia would break with the Union and seek protection from the Russians. Within a year, Russian forces would completely overrun the remaining Union state. Russia had catapulted back to the world stage, and they weren't done. The Balkan peace deal had left the region volatile, border clashes had become extremely common, and the air was ripe for a full conflict. Especially Greece was tense. 
they had gained so much territory, by far most of which was not even close to being Greek. Atrocities were common and Russia and Italy began pulling some strings. Turkey and Bulgaria would jointly start a war against the Greeks. Greece held the best they could, but they were on the losing end. Russian and Italian aid bolstered their allies greatly. The war shifted though when Romania suddenly entered the conflict, threatening the Bulgarian rear. Should Bulgaria collapse, the entire plan would be in jeopardy. Luckily, for them that is, Italy managed to pull some strings in Hungary, and it was now Romania that was being pushed from the back. In a desperate move from Greece, they attempted to get Serbia in on the war, but Italian threats that if this happened, they would also get involved, put an end to this hope. Soon, Romania would seek a negotiated peace, and Greece, soon after, threw in the towel as well. As part of the peace deal, Turkey would take back their desired territories, moving their capital to the newly liberated Istanbul. As a reward for Russian aid, Turkey would accept new borders with Armenia, while allowing Russia significant control over shipping through the Bosphorus. On the other side of the water, the Bulgarians had now reached the coastline as well, and Italy, despite not being involved in the war, would gain Greece's western territories. While not official, the new Greek government could now do little but align with the growing Russian-Italian axis. Finally, the Hungarians would be rewarded with major parts of Transylvania. Much like with Greece, Romania was forcibly aligned with the new Southern European order. But around the same time, a far greater conflict would erupt over Asia. Tsar Nicholas was carefully constructing a new Trans-Siberian Railway. Once it was completed, he would finally be able to launch his desired reconquest against the Japanese, Tsar Nicholas's number one goal. The building of this railway was done in as much secrecy as possible and the Japanese wouldn't learn of it until its very late stages. This gave the Japanese a false sense of security, and they began their invasion of China, first invading Manchuria, and soon after launching a complete invasion of the nation. When this war began to drag for four years, the Japanese were seemingly stuck. It is at this point that they learned of the Russian buildup, and they became terrified. Russia coming to China's aid could be a devastating blow to Japanese ambitions. So, the Japanese launched surprise attacks on the Russian project, suddenly exploding key parts of the railway. In response, Nicholas hastened up his plans and declared war on Japan. Japan would consolidate control over the east, but struggled to advance towards Russia. The war that resulted would last seven years and be gruesome for all sides involved. But Russia did hold the advantage, slowly chipping away at Japanese control from the west. The Russians' greatest advantage came from the millions of Russians who lived in these territories, fighting the Japanese behind the lines. Slowly but steadily, the Russian armies would advance farther and farther. When Russia entered Manchuria, they realized that Japan would really fight until the bitter end. And so, a peace deal was proposed. Japan would be allowed to keep Manchuria, Taiwan and Korea if they surrendered the rest to the Russians. Considering the circumstances, a pretty fair deal. But Japan didn't surrender. Two more years were necessary, but Japan was finally thrown from the continent, and the war was practically over. The peace deal would see Russia annex Central Asia, all of Mongolia, and the two eastern breakaway states. Korea was turned into a Russian puppet, and China, now a strong Russian ally, regains Manchuria. The Russian Empire had achieved the complete victory they had desired and now controlled most of Eurasia. This rising Russian Empire and their Italian allies became a worry for the rest of Europe, leading to a formal alliance between Germany, France and Poland. Soon they were joined by Sweden and Latvia, both terrified of a Russian invasion. Poland and Ukraine began sorting out their own differences, allowing Ukraine to join the alliance as well. In fact, Poland and Ukraine lay the basis for the Intermarium Plan, an economic federation of Eastern European states, as Poland gave autonomy to their eastern territories. This new union would form the backbone of the anti-Russian alliance, with Czechoslovakia joining shortly and attempts being made to get Romania and Hungary to join as well. 
Tensions are ever rising as the two factions head towards a climactic confrontation. And that's the situation of Europe in the mid 40s. Europe divided in two parts and everyone looks at Britain and who they may support. But despite the dominions firmly rejecting closer integration into Britain, Britain remains committed to their colonial focus, working tirelessly to cause the controversial collapse of the United Arab State, ensuring British companies monopolize Middle Eastern oil. Japan has become an increasingly cartoonishly evil military dictatorship, mostly cutting contact with the outside world. Their final humiliation would come at the hands of the Americans. America had loaned a lot of money to Japan during their war with Russia. Money that Japan couldn't repay. At threat of war with America, Japan would have to sell all of their Pacific territories to them. The new Japanese dictatorship remains focused on a singular objective. Destroying the Russian Empire. This is the state of the world as we leave it for today. I thank you all for attending. I hope you all learned something. And don't forget to subscribe and join me for future classes. If you enjoyed it, maybe click on one of the videos on the right to keep watching.